If I were to ask you what you think the most underrated Call of Duty was, what would you say? Infinite Warfare? Ghosts? Black Ops Cold War, Modern Warfare 2 2022. Oh, okay, okay. Let's not kid ourselves. I would say the most underrated Call of Duty game is one most people never even mention. One that built up so much hype just to be torn down by the trends of the time. A game plagued by poor leadership, a game plagued by bugs and glitches, and a game that despite all, innovated in ways that you'd never expect. That game is Call of Duty World War II. By the middle of Infinite Warfare's life cycle, fans were already clamoring for the next entry into the Call of Duty franchise. Call of Duty Modern Warfare Remastered, which was bundled into a more pricey version of Infinite Warfare, thanks Activision, led fans to beg the dev teams to bring back the classic boots on the ground movement. In addition to that request, fans wanted to return to the past or even the present as the future setting was wearing thin year after year. Then, on April 26, 2017, a curious little trailer appeared on Call of Duty's YouTube channel. On paper, Call of Duty World War II was the answer to millions of fans' complaints. Boots on the ground gameplay, an OG Call of Duty setting of the 1940s rather than decades or centuries into the future, and a reason to get your boys back online. Yet, why was this game forgotten? Why does it never come up in conversation? Does the community hate it or do we just forget what it had to offer? Did the complete overhaul of this game aid to its survival? Or by the time it got good, was it already left in the dust? Now join me in exploring the story behind what might just be the most underrated Call of Duty in the franchise history. Advanced Warfare and Black Ops 3 had been well received by the Call of Duty community alongside their new movement system centered around flying with an exosuit. But by the end of Treyarch's run in 2016, fans were ready for Infinity War to try something new, fresh, and nostalgic. So what did Infinity War do? <laughs> They released the game that nearly killed the Call of Duty franchise. While Die Hard stayed with the game, mostly thanks to the Modern Warfare Remastered, casuals left in favor for more of a classic FPS game, Battlefield 1. Devastated at sales numbers, but still somehow managing to come out ahead of EA, Activision went back to the drawing board. They had to make a plan to get players to return. They were going to take Call of Duty back to its roots. The next year, Activision swung back. They announced what they believed to be the savior of the Call of Duty franchise, Call of Duty World War II. There was actually rumors around Sledgehammer's game being Advanced Warfare 2, but Activision actually vetoed it and it told them to go back to the basics. Ironically, the trailer was reminiscent of a very similar trailer from the year prior. That must have just been a coincidence. Fans were thrilled to see the direction Sledgehammer Games was taking, which resulted in this trailer reaching the top of the trending page and racking up a total of 1 million likes in just a few days. If you compare this to the Infinite Warfare trailer, yeah, this is much better. The hype was real for Sledgehammer's second ever Call of Duty entry and old fans were finally returning. Praise was thrown at both Activision and Sledgehammer for finally listening to the community. Not much was announced after the initial launch trailer. There was a story trailer, multiplayer trailer, and a few behind the scenes live streams exploring the game's offerings. Also announced was a Destiny 2-esque online player hub where players could show off their prestige levels and characters in between matches. Although there was no game play to accompany it, people were hyped because this was something that Destiny did really well. Now a little side note, right around this time a little game you may never have heard of began to rise in popularity, Fortnite. It won't come into play till later, but it's important to note that this timing as it creates a total shift in how World War II is received at launch. November 3rd, 2017 inched closer and closer and fans anticipation was reaching higher and higher. The beta was received with decent enough reception despite some server issues and pre-orders were higher than they had been in years. Playing the open beta was even incentivized via a free helmet to customize each player's character. Then the day arrived. The game didn't work. Server issues persisted throughout launch week, rendering the game borderline unplayable. Not even the solid campaign could make up for the failed matchmaking services upon launch. Cause let's be honest, most Call of Duty players are playing multiplayer first. 
These issues took about a week to get resolved, but when they did, players then began to realize just how rough and bland the game really was. The promised customization lacked any depth. Players were able to customize their soldier, but not more than outfits and helmets. And how did you earn these? Supply drops. Yes, the infamous microtransaction cash grab came back. And they even gave you a platform to show off what you got in the supply drops by opening them up in the HQ. You could also get gun variants from supply drops, but there just weren't many attachments to even unlock per gun. Topping off the questionable decisions was the removal of the create a class system in replacement for a division system. Players picked their division in order to begin a class setup. They could pick infantry if they wanted to feel like a traditional frontline soldier with a semi-automatic rifle and a self-loading pistol, expeditionary for players wanting to be an aggressive scout with shotguns and the dreaded and poorly balanced incinerary shells. Airborne for those wanting a submachine gun to run and gun. Armored for heavies who want to use armor, LMGs, and bazookas. And Mountain for those who want to be a long range fighter and snipe to assist their team. These divisions locked you into one kind of weapon and forced players to stick to specific playstyle. Want a trick shot and run and gun with a sniper? No. Too bad. You hang out behind everyone on the front lines. Want to suppress any gun that isn't an SMG? Oops, only SMGs can use them. This system attempted to be innovative, yet proved counterintuitive both to COD fans and new players. And get this, as a part of the division system, limited sprint became the norm, and you were forced to choose between either carrying a tactical grenade or a lethal grenade. You could not have both normally. Limited sprint made the game feel much slower, especially coming off the tail end of the exosuit era in which the new movement made the game feel quicker. And the forced selection between lethal and tactical grenades made them feel practically useless and only handy in oddly specific scenarios rather than having the flexibility of carrying both for any situation players would encounter. These gross changes plagued what once was a flawless multiplayer system and honestly all playstyles just felt the same. The game also shipped with a minimal amount of maps on day one. At launch players could only battle on nine maps and one of these was Gustav Cannon. The idea of bringing the boys back together was already collapsing before the fans eyes. Remember when I mentioned a little game called Fortnite? Well, that was one of the handful of factors in World War II's decline in popularity. Fortnite's popularity rose quickly towards the end of summer 2017 and continued to keep growing into the fall of 2017. What made it so popular was its price tag of zero dollars, which encouraged gamers everywhere to check it out. This was unheard of at the time. When it came to Call of Duty World War II's $60 price tag, a lot of players found themselves debating whether or not it was worth it. This further drove the dilemma and made it easier for players just to move to Fortnite. In Fortnite, you get a group of guys together and it's zero dollars. On top of all this, Fortnite introduced cross-platform. So if your buddy was on PlayStation or Xbox or PC, you could all play together. Outside of just casual gamers, content creators even found themselves moving over to Fortnite content. The biggest example of this creator shift would be Ali A. For the longest time, Ali A was the biggest name in COD content creation. He had played every Call of Duty, whether it was in its prime of the game or during Infinite Warfare. Ali A stayed on top and was the king of this gaming subculture on YouTube. Ali A started off playing COD World War II just like he did every year with the new installment. But then he one day decided to upload Fortnite while Call of Duty's popularity online began to tank and the rest is history. His COD channel slowly became solely about Fortnite and the once king of COD had given up his crown. Luckily, we saw the rise of new creators like Dismo who rose out of the empty void of content creators who left COD for Fortnite. The sad truth remains that at this time, Call of Duty World War II was just stale. Even the three new modes couldn't keep fans entertained. The modes Gridiron and War were added alongside with the 1v1 pit in the HQ, but couldn't hold people's attention for more than an hour or so. How the 1v1 pit worked was that players signed up to 1v1 and vote on what weapons to use. The winner stays and the leaderboard shows off who has the highest win streak in the HQ. Gridiron was a boots on the ground take on Black Ops 3's uplink. Players are tasked with carrying a ball across the map to their enemy's goal in order to score points. When someone has the ball, they can't use a gun and it's up to their teammates to help them. War Mode was a linear objective-based game mode that saw players passing through three stages of a specifically designed map to reach 
the end goal. One second, you could be storming the beaches of Normandy, and the next, you and your team are guiding a tank to blow up artillery guns. This mode added a much new and needed, fresh approach to gameplay that resembled that of one of COD's competitor FPS games, Overwatch. Despite how well these three modes were made, it couldn't hold players already dwindling interest in the game. Bored and disappointed, COD fans either continued to force feed themselves more and more World War II gameplay or moved on entirely to Fortnite. Then, the first DLC pack was announced, The Resistance. DLC releases in past Call of Duty games had felt more like low-stake fun additions to the game to keep it from getting repetitive, but DLC Pack 1 felt like it was going to be a make or break for Call of Duty World War II. The game needed more content, and it needed it stacked. Anticipation rose until the DLC's launch on PS4 on January 30th, 2018. The Resistance DLC introduced three new multiplayer maps, one war mode map, and one zombies map. This DLC was turning out to be the same as the past ones. A few maps made to spice up the rotation of the base game. The three multiplayer maps were Occupation, Valkyrie, and Anthropoid. Anthropoid took place in Prague and focused around a center lane design with good spots for sniping. It was fine. Valkyrie took place in the woods of East Prussia and was a solid map. It had a great World War II aesthetic and a good layout, arguably one of the better DLC maps that entire year. The biggest one that excited fans, however, was Occupation, which was a remake of Resistance from Modern Warfare 3. Do I have to say Modern Warfare 3 2011 now, or are we calling MW3 2023? Uh, who cares? The new war map was nothing to shake a stick at, and barely anyone cared for zombies as it was trying too hard to be like Treyarch's beloved mode, so the rest of the pack was a snooze fest to most fans. The biggest thing, however, was the new division called Resistance. Players were finally excited to see if this would give us a purpose to the division system, and it didn't. The Resistance division only introduced a tactical knife skill and a new pistol. Players couldn't even use the tactical knife on pistols within other divisions. What was the point? Things were looking rough and player counts were continuing to fall. So, Activision decided to step in to attempt to create one of the biggest comeback stories in franchise history. On February 20th, 2018, the COD community was met with a wild announcement. Activision announced that Glenn Schofield and Michael Condry, the founders of Sledgehammer Games, had decided to transition from their duties at Sledgehammer to executive roles at Activision. This felt out of left field. Many believed the pair was fired after the dumpster fire that was World War II's launch and the poor fan reception, but no true answer was ever given. Aaron Halen was placed in their positions and is still the studio head to this day. So what did this mean for fans? The Call of Duty community was terrified amid the chaos of these departures. Was World War II going to get three more DLCs anymore? Was it going to get overhauled and fixed to the fans' liking? Was there ever going to be an Advanced Warfare 2? Well, fans wouldn't get this answer until April 10th when DLC 2 War Machine launched for PS4. This is the overhaul that saved Call of Duty World War II. The DLC came with more maps, the coolest one being based in Egypt, but it also introduced massive gameplay changes. The visions were completely changed. It was finally similar to the original create a class system. Bayonets, suppressors, incinerary shells, and the tactical knife were officially added as attachments for any weapon. They were no longer locked behind one division. The disastrous division system was finally gone. They also eliminated the basic training titled Primed, which allowed players to have an extra attachment slot. Now, every loadout gave guns an extra attachment slot, but that wasn't all. Now players could have both a tactical grenade and a lethal grenade. No longer were you forced to have one over the other. Launchers could also be secondaries on any division. And to top it all off, Sledgehammer had one more surprise for COD fans. Limited Sprint was no more. Unlimited Sprint was back and a standard across all divisions. This was one of the biggest complaints of fans pre-DLC 2, and the devs actually listened. Prayers had been answered and things were finally looking positive for fans of Call of Duty World War II. It was also around this time that Sledgehammer Games took a less grounded approach to the game than before 
and allowed for more goofy and unrealistic maps to exist. The best example of this was from the summer event in which the map Sandbox was announced. This had players shrunken down to little army men and placed in a children's sandbox. On top of this, Captain Butcher was shining the sun's energy down into the map via a magnifying glass to burn people who crossed its path. The outfits also started to get crazier. They also introduced super fun game modes, such as Horde Point. This mode is essentially Hard Point, but with zombie NPCs roaming around the map. So on top of players going for you, the zombies were attacking you as well. Infected and Prop Punt were also introduced to the party game's playlist. Supply drop weapons also got goofier. I mean, they even added a sword to the game. All of this plus two more solid DLC packs helped to keep players satisfied until the launch of Black Ops 4. Call of Duty World War II was finally living up to its potential. The devs were listening to the fans and the new headed sledgehammer game seemed to be helping the company's reputation. Despite all of these positives, player numbers didn't rise as by the time these changes took effect people had already moved on Call of Duty World War II was promised to be the Call of Duty game to bring us back to the franchise's roots. While it delivered on these promises, it took half of its life cycle to get it right. It's understandable why fans left weeks after launch, and even more understandable that they didn't return after the game's overhaul. Everything was against this game. Poor leadership, the rise of Fortnite, the bland color and setting of World War II. But the craziest part of it all? Call of Duty World War II was the best-selling game on the PS4 store in 2017, and its first two DLC packs were in the top selling DLC lists in PS4 as well. It just goes to show you how popular Call of Duty is even when it feels like it's failing. Hopefully though, after having this year of chaos contextualized, you too will see how the least remembered Call of Duty title may have just been the most underappreciated.